Hi, I'm John, welcome to Premium Builds. The Gigabyte DS3H, and I will get that name wrong at least once in this video, is one of the most affordable B660 motherboards out there. But are you compromising if you do choose this for your build? We've got the AX Wi-Fi enabled version here, and we've run it through our suite of testing, including an i3, an i5, and an i7 CPU, and we've built it into a range of systems as well so that we can get to grips with it and offer you our opinion on whether we think it's right for your PC. We'll look around its features and specifications and talk about its performance. And there is one major flaw with this motherboard's performance that you will want to fix either if you own it already or you're considering purchasing it. So let's get stuck in and take a look around this board. First of all, you can see the VRM here, which is a nine phase total, but six phases to the CPU core. And it is a relatively weak VRM. You can see it's also got very basic heat sinking just on one section of the VRM. And the top section here is completely unheat synced and we'll see the impact of that later in our performance section. There's also this comedy heat sink which actually comes away if you mishandle the board. It'll pull the heat sinking off of the VRM. So make sure you press it back on if that happens to ensure the thermal pads are making proper contact with the MOSFETs beneath. It also has a single 8 pin connector for power and that's all you need to wire up to ensure that the CPU is optimally powered. The motherboard does have four RAM slots in total. It'll fit up to 128 gigabytes of RAM, and it does quote speeds of up to 5,333 megahertz, although that's wildly optimistic for this board. And realistically, you're gonna be fitting RAM around 3,200 to 3,600 megahertz to it. For M.2 storage, there's this main M.2 slot, which is PCIe 4.0 times four up to the CPU. And then there's this secondary slot, which is also PCIe 4.0 and goes via the chipset. Note that neither of these slots will take SATA M.2 drives and you do need PCIe NVMe drives in order to be compatible with them. For PCIe slots, we just have one full length PCIe 4.0 times 16 slot. And these two slots down here are both PCIe 3.0 times one. They don't have open backs on them, so you are restricted to a single length card fitting in either of those slots. For audio, we see the ALC897 codec, which is very basic, but expected at this price point. It's perfectly reasonable for gaming and general use. There are four SATA connectors, two of them at the side here, and two of them just alongside the 24 pin connector just here. For fans and cooling, we have a single CPU fan header located here, and then three chassis fan headers, which are located at this point up near the rear fan, one down along the bottom edge just here, and one next to the 24 pin here. There are two RGB headers located here and here. However, there's absolutely no RGB elements on this motherboard at all. Also missing is that there are no postcode diagnostic display LEDs, which does mean that you can be a little bit in the dark if the board won't boot and you're not sure why. Strangely, although it lacks those, this motherboard does actually have a quick flash BIOS button and also a reset switch on the motherboard, which is a strange addition at this price point, but quite handy to have. Just moving around to look at the rear of the motherboard then, we can see that we've got five USB-A ports, two of them are USB 2.0, and three of them are USB 3.2 Gen 1. There is also USB 3.2 Gen 2 on the rear of the motherboard. However, note that this motherboard does not have an internal USB 3.2 connector, so if your case comes with one of those connectors, those ports will be dead unless you use an adapter. For networking, we've got a 2.5 gigabit Realtek LAN controller, and this is also the Wi-Fi model, with Wi-Fi antennas at the rear here. There are actually three separate revisions already listed for the Wi-Fi, although it's all Intel AX200 standard. There are slight revisions as they're updating this board and it is equipped with Bluetooth 5.2 as well. Note that you will have to attach the antenna to get Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. The video output on this board is two DisplayPort outputs and a single HDMI out. And for audio output, we just have the three basic audio jacks as output at the rear. It's a basic but pretty reasonable rear I.O. specification overall. Included in the box, you've got a very cheap separate I.O. shield, which just has the symbols stamped into it. On this Wi-Fi version, they haven't even stamped out the Wi-Fi antenna holes. That's something you have to do yourself. It's really cheap and nasty, but it is kind of expected at this price point. What wasn't expected was this bizarrely nice Wi-Fi antenna. It's a really nice looking bit of kit and I'd be quite happy to have it on display in the living room or office. So that's a decent addition and some quite nice added value. It would go well with a white case. If you're finding this review useful so far, please do just take a moment to click like and subscribe to our channel. It helps us out immensely. It means we can continue to bring you this kind of information about products and ensure that you're getting the absolute best value for money as you build your new PC. So to summarize the features and specification of this board then, it is a reasonable overall specification. It's acceptable, particularly with regards to the rear IO, which has got a good range of USB ports, those display outputs, and in this case, it's got Wi-Fi inbuilt as well, which is handy. 
There is also two M.2 slots at PCIe 4.0, which is decent enough. On the downside, there are a number of drawbacks with the specification of this board. There's the lack of any boot diagnostic LEDs, which is an oversight and can frustrate the setup of this board if you do run into any problems on first boot. There's the fact that it's only got two single length PCIe slots, which can restrict the expandability of this board. For example, higher bandwidth devices like a capture card may require a four length slot and not fit onto this motherboard. It is lacking a separate AIO pump header, but it's not a major issue because most AIOs can actually run off of the CPU fan header instead and at least it does have three separate system fan headers. Finally, it's really just the looks of this board, which we understand aren't important for everyone. They do go in a box after all. However, the lack of heat sinking is a bit of an issue. We'll see the impact of that later in the performance section. This motherboard does have a very basic VRM and also very basic heat sinking on just part of it, which does mean that it is susceptible to VRM throttling. Moving on to the BIOS, the Gigabyte BIOS is functional and effective, if unremarkable. The main issue we want to draw your attention to here is the need to upgrade the BIOS on this board, or at least check that it is running BIOS version F5 or higher. The BIOS that ship with this board severely limited performance, and it does need to be upgraded to obtain optimal performance out of an i5 CPU. Other than that, we don't find the BIOS particularly well laid out, and it is tricky to navigate and input some settings. However, everything is there, and it should hopefully take minimal setup. Easy mode makes it simple to access and set XMP for RAM, and adjust fan profiles without getting lost in the depth of menus. As part of our process of testing this motherboard, we ran it through a suite of tests involving an i3, an i5, and an i7 CPU. The Gigabyte didn't fare well initially, returning really poor results across the board. We identified that as being down to the BIOS version. Updating the board to the F5 BIOS saw a dramatic increase in performance. However, it did still appear at the bottom of the table across all of our tests, giving away a few frames per second in gaming tests and scoring slightly lower in the benchmark tests. And this was despite adjusting the power limits to allow the CPUs to run unthrottled. We also identified some slightly odd boosting behavior with this motherboard when running the i5 CPU. This board restricted boost clocks on the i5-12600 to 4.1 GHz under an all-core load, when it should achieve 4.4 GHz. We had to manually adjust power limits to allow full performance in Cinebench R23, for example. It's just another indication of the way this board does require a fairly intricate setup to have it perform optimally, even with non-K CPUs. Also in Cinebench R23, we subjected it to the rather unfair test of a sustained 10-minute workload using the i7-12700K CPU, and this really did expose the bitter end of the Gigabyte's VRM capability. You can see in this graph how thermal throttling forces the VRM to restrict power to the CPU over time, causing reduced performance. Obviously, this board isn't a good pairing with an unlimited i7 CPU. It can't supply the necessary power over long time periods for demanding workloads. You can also see the impact of the weaker VRM and the lack of heat sinks when we compare VRM temperatures to a known good board, the MSI Pro B660M-A. Temperatures, as reported by the board, climb rapidly, approaching 100 degrees C and then throttling. Again, this isn't really a fair test as it's not a sensible CPU pairing, but it is just to demonstrate the limitations of the board. You should make sure your case has good airflow to help the VRMs cool themselves, even if you are just using an i5 CPU. Overall then, this motherboard isn't a great performer. Out of the box, it performed terribly, and once the BIOS was updated and power limits were lifted, it still underperformed slightly with our i5 CPU. We certainly can't recommend it for use with an i7 CPU, CPU. However, it will do a decent job with an i3 or an i5 non-K. If you use this motherboard, make sure you take the time after building your PC to get it set up properly. Make sure it's running that latest BIOS from the Gigabyte website, and manually adjust power limits with an i5 CPU as well to ensure that it can supply the full 100 watts that the i5s do need to perform optimally. Finally, do just run some benchmark tests once you've got it all set up to make sure your system's performing comparably to others with the same specification. It might just be you need to do a little bit of tweaking in BIOS to get that optimum performance out of it. There's also been a lot of interest in optimal RAM selection for the older Lake platform, and we can report that with this motherboard, we had no problems whatsoever running our G-Skill 3600MHz CL16 RAM kit. It ran in gear one throughout all of our testing, and there are no performance or stability problems at all. However, it is something other people are reporting that 3600MHz RAM may not run in gear one mode. Therefore, we'd just suggest that if stability is a key concern and you don't want to get into manually tweaking RAM, 3200MHz CL16 RAM is probably the sweet spot 
spot for you. It's also probably a bit cheaper than 3600 MHz RAM, and this is a board that you're gonna be considering if you're really looking to save money, and you're probably not looking for that optimal performance. We'd suggest if you really do want to optimize RAM, then you consider also optimizing your motherboard and choosing one that does perform better with the CPUs. As we've already demonstrated, this motherboard isn't a top performer, and it's not one you should choose if you're looking to eke out that last percentage point of performance from your CPU. The Gigabyte B660M DS3H is one of the cheapest B660 motherboards available and we do have to judge its value in that context. Whilst the overall feature set is fairly reasonable, unfortunately the compromises Gigabyte have made do appear to impact performance. It's a decent pairing with an i3 or the lower end i5 CPUs, but that cutback VRM and the lack of heat sinking does mean that we can't recommend it for any more powerful CPU than that. On the plus side, it does have those two M.2 slots and a decent rear I.O., and it will form the basis of a decent all-round and gaming PC, just so long as you are aware of the compromises you're getting. Overall then, the Gigabyte DS3H offers a good entry point for an i3 CPU, and it is an acceptable pairing with an i5 entry-level CPU as well. If cost is a primary concern for you, then this motherboard does work, it's got a decent feature set overall, and as long as you're prepared to put a little bit of time in just to make sure it's performing optimally, it will serve you well. We'd recommend it, for example, for an office build with an i3, those multiple display outputs could come in handy there, and it will run that CPU with no problems at all. If you are looking for a more general purpose or gamer-centric build based around an i5 CPU, we'd only consider this motherboard if you really are having to count every dollar to get a system together. We think it's worth spending a little bit extra for a slightly nicer motherboard like the Asus Tough, Prime, the Gigabyte Gaming X perhaps, or the MSI Pro B660M-A or Bazooka, all of which just offer rock solid performance, much less hassle setting them up, and an equivalent or better feature set to enable you really to get the most out of those CPUs and ensure you don't have any performance issues going forwards. The Gigabyte B660M DS3H then, we feel really represents the rock bottom of the B660 motherboard market. It's a reasonable purchase provided you know what you're getting for your money and you go in with your eyes open in terms of the compromises you're making. Where it's very frustrating for us is the fact that a lot of people will run this motherboard and won't think to check or update their BIOS and therefore could be suffering really bad performance from what is actually a very capable CPU when paired with this motherboard. The word really needs to get out that people should be checking and updating this BIOS to ensure their CPUs are performing optimally. Likewise, you do actually need to manually adjust those power limits to get the most out of an i5 CPU, so do make sure you're checking and adjusting that as well. I really hope you found this review useful. Please do click like and subscribe. It really helps us continue to be able to bring you this kind of information and ensure that you're getting the best value for money as you build your new PC.